the God of Run. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Patrick Larney. He's a musical entrepreneur and the manager of the terrific new country cosmo team known as the Vanity Bells. I met Patrick over a year ago at the Apple Store when I was taking Final Cut Pro classes. He started out as a very terrific instructor, and then he became a very good friend. Please welcome to the show, Patrick Larney. How are you doing? Great to be here, Will. It's great to see you, Patrick, and looking so terrific. Well, thank you. Okay. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, let's get started by sharing with our audience a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? A little bit about your family? Something about your schooling? Sure. Um, uh, I grew up, um, my father uh, was a farmer growing up. Uh, my mother was a nurse. I grew up in northwest New Jersey in um, uh, on a Christmas tree farm, of all things. Uh, pretty interesting. Cool. Um, but uh, I had uh, great schooling. Um, the, the music background, I, my, my grammar school teacher was a guy named Jack Idenden, who was uh, real well respected in the community and uh, has had a ton of students go on to uh, music careers. So This is in high great. school? This was uh, in grammar school. And then my goodness. In, yeah, and then in high school, um, I did what pretty much everybody else did, you know, the chorus and special choral programs and uh, did theater, you know, and the musicals that were available. During. Okay. Well, now, you grew up in a, in a farm. It must have been lots of opportunity to do athletic things, like run around. Right. Um, I've actually, uh, you know, now that I've, that I've moved to the city, one of the things that I think I miss the most is just like an open field. Um, I grew up with uh, two brothers and a sister. And uh, we, uh, the, me and the two brothers would play like, well, what we considered Australian rules rugby, but that was just basically meant whoever had the ball, tackle them and, and try to put <laughs> as much bodily harm on them as you can. As and your sister was the goalie, or what, um, what role did she play? <laughs> well, I, my sister usually played, uh, you know, um, cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't. She didn't necessarily take part in, in the uh, in in the whole thing. But my sister was actually very athletic. Uh -huh. uh, we probably didn't let her participate because women grow up a lot faster than men do, and she was a lot taller and probably faster. Oh, okay, and bigger she's than a little, little older than you. So yeah. Oh, okay. And we can't. We couldn't have lost to to our sister. So. Okay. <laughs> she, was, she wasn't really invited. Well, she had bragging rights. <laughs> That's right. At the Larney table. Well, what about college? Where did you go to college? And um, what was your major? I went to college at. Um, um, uh, the College of New Jersey, which, um, as you know, was previously Trenton State College. Um, and I majored in uh, graphic design. Um, and uh, that kind of led me into uh, the work that I ended up doing with Apple. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I studied a lot of digital media, which is where, um, from this music background uh, in the independent world, um, managing the Vanity Bells, um, that's kind of where I've launched most of this stuff from is the stuff that I, I learned in college and from what I learned uh, with Apple. I mean, social media is a, is a huge, huge thing today, uh, as, as you know. And um, uh, the internet is can literally put you in touch with the entire world. At, at school, did they have Final Cut at that uh, at that time? Um, at, at, at the time, that see now you're asking me to date myself. <laughs> but um, Final Cut Pro was not available uh, at the time. Uh, but um, there was a program called Director, which was my first experience with uh, digital uh, directing and editing. Uh -huh. Non-linear editing, I think they call yeah, it. Yeah. NLE. Exactly. Yep. Director. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who made that? Um, you know, I don't. I don't even remember. Okay. But well, how did point. how did you get into into Final Cut? And and besides Final Cut, you probably know Avid to some of the other. Uh, sure, I know a little bit about it. I actually, um, uh, I my roommate in college uh, had always. Uh, uh, his name's Andy Stroll. He was always into video, like uh, would record everything. I mean, when I was skateboarding in, in college, he was, uh, you know, taking video of, of my skateboarding. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was really interesting to watch his passion turn into uh, into an art form. And uh, uh, he was studying a lot of that. They had, there was a late night show that used to go on in Princeton, and I don't remember what it was called, I think it was called Jigs or, or something like that. And um, and uh, uh, he used to help with the direction of, of that show and I played on it musically. And that's actually where 
most of my history, uh, where I got my interest at least, to do any type of editing came from from my roommate. I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm a curious man by nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if I don't know how something works, I, I, I want to know how it works. And so, uh, you know, as he was studying that stuff, I was asking him, and he was kind of a mentor for me in that way. Uh, and then when I got in, but he was all analog. And then when I got into digital, um, years later, uh, he came back to me and said, I, I'm ready to move from this analog to this digital world. Can you kind of oh, re-instruct okay. me? You know? oh, okay, so, so you became a mentor. That's right, right. I became Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. You know? Were you at, <laughs> at the Apple Store at that point? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, he took on uh, digital um, so incredibly quickly. And, uh, uh, and he now uh, actually owns his own business called Stroll Digital mm -hmm. um, and uh, has a tons of... Uh, well, how do you spell that? It sounds like... S-T-R-O-H-L. H digital, oh, okay. and he does everything from corporate videos to uh, uh, personal bios, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, everything across the board, and it's great. And I like to help him out with all that stuff as well because it's still a passion of mine as well. Okay, well, I, I have to mention the the Apple Store and, and your teaching there, because at the time I went there, I had some training here at MNN, which is mm -hmm. terrific, but I felt something was missing. I really was very uncomfortable. I was more of a behind the shoulder editor, sure. and and the first day I met you, I was struck by the way you were able to do analogies of things. Was this something that from your parents that you learned? Would they encourage your creativity like that? Well, I feel that, um, you know, uh my my father's a, a, a great man as far as his, uh, his literature is concerned. My mm -hmm. dad's a, a great writer, and my mother is, a, is a, was always a singer and a great writer as well. Um, growing up, they've always kind of encouraged uh, the, any poem that I wrote or any song that I was writing. They always nurtured that. Um, and But one thing that my father and mother always made really important was to make sure that you read. And it didn't really necessarily matter what the source was, but it was just just read, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think that there's a great connection, I think, between um, people who have great vocabularies and are able to to speak even creatively. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a command on the English language, it's easier to present uh, analogies and art like that. Mm -hmm. I've always kind of been a writer, so I think uh, maybe what you were sensing is that, you know. Uh, Songwriters are, are are teachers as well. You know, um, mm -hmm. they're they're teaching about their experience, and people relate to whatever it is that they're mm -hmm. that they're singing about or, or or saying. They're kind of teaching you the things that maybe you already know, but you didn't know how to to say it. You know, and so taking something that uh, uh, my grandmother actually one of the things that she said that I thought was brilliant was that. Um, you know, a genius might not necessarily be somebody who's smarter than anybody else, or, um, but that a genius is somebody who uh, can take something that's very profound mm -hmm. and put it into a very simple statement and mm -hmm. make it simple for somebody. Mm. Um, and so uh, I think that's true because if you were in, you know, 1700s and talking about a shuttle, you know, a, a NASA shuttle to, yeah, to yeah. the moon, people would look at you and just say, you're crazy. But if you could sit down with a piece of paper and tell them exactly how to do it in simple uh, a form, then, then of course, you're a genius. Hmm, that's interesting. But, you know, you, I, I understand being a songwriter and, and having the background, yeah, but you, you, we can tell sitting in the audience, sitting in the classroom, that you gave it a lot of thought in behind your teaching because you always had a story or you had an analogy. So it's more than that. You were also very, very well prepared. Well, I well, I, I can't give myself too much credit for that because I did teach that class like about a million times. So, um, so I think that uh, what whatever the you know, you can you can read your audience. You mm -hmm. know, uh, one of the most important things as even an entertainer is to read your audience, and you can tell by people's reactions if they're understanding what you're saying. So, I think through those classes, I would try different analogies, and some of them would stand the test of time, and oh. some of them wouldn't. So, oh. uh, you know, um, and I know I keep bringing this back to songwriting, but that's that's where 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 my mind is. But yeah. you know. Writing a good song is really more about writing a terrible song and then erase, erasing everything that's terrible so that everything, the only thing that's left is good. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, refinement, if uh -huh, you will. Uh -huh. And uh, and I think that that is uh, is is 
so important in everything, but especially teaching. You know, um, if you put an analogy out there and you get that kind of look right, from right, right. people, or I'm still confused. But when you get that aha uh -huh. look, then you know straight away that hey, that's made a connection to somebody who might not necessarily understand this. Right, right. And the same thing when I'm playing songs, uh, you know, my new songs for, for for people. If it's something that somebody says, you know, aha, or I have that face, I know that hey, that's a lyric that has you know reached through the the murky murky crowd uh, cloud if you will and 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 grab somebody and be like hey I understand that and so really I just think it was refinement of all those little things and then and then and then just looping it well you make it sound easy but uh, I've had many 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 teachers in my career because I went to grammar school I went to high school I went to college and I yeah. went to graduate school and and you've got to be one of the top two or three teachers I've ever met well because of the way you were able to fill in the the gaps. I think you used an analogy once of Swiss cheese. Right, 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 right. I said that um, um, uh, I feel that a lot of people with this, um, you know, the the internet is taking off, and with the internet taking off, you have this whole new, all these new platforms, and uh, people know how to move a mouse, and you know, uh, their generation, you know, just above me and just above them, they know how to use a mouse. They understand the screen. They understand there's other people on there, and they can talk to people. And what I say is that they have a Swiss cheese education in uh, in uh, um, technology editing. or well, editing, editing or whatever case. it is, right? And uh, it was kind of up to me just to kind of fill in the holes of that and you know make it a, make it a block of cheddar, if you will. Uh, <laughs> if, well, if that's not cheesy uh, or, <laughs> or close to it. But you know, before we talk about running, I, I want to just talk about Final Cut Pro 10 because sure. that took off about six months ago. It was launched, and the controversy was unbelievable. Now, it's six months later, or if you, you know, what's your feeling about 10, and where do you think that's going to go? Well, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, speak for, for Apple on that case, but, um, uh, but me personally, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate of uh, FCPX, and I use it a ton with the vanity mm -hmm, belts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've, I was editing for a real long time, and now I'm exclusively FCPX. Um, and I think if you educate yourself on it, it is definitely the editing software of today. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Well, great. Now, let's talk a little bit about, since this has got to run with Will. Sure. Now, at some point, uh, you decided you needed to improve your stamina. Well, you know, what got you into... You know, maybe you're not doing marathons, but you're doing something with your running. What encouraged you? Sure. So, um, you know, when I was a, a child playing the lawn games with my brothers um, all the time, I was literally running everywhere that I went. I was active all the time. And um, my metabolism was always just very high. So I was a very, very skinny child. I could hula hoop with a Cheerio if I needed to. But, um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it was just the fact that I think that my metabolism just needed to be matched with being active all the time. Um, and then when, you know, it gets difficult because so many people's jobs today are sitting in front of one of those little pixelated boxes, you know, and um, um, it takes away from a lot of the physical activity um, that they might do in a day. I mean, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. everybody's, you know, pointer finger is in, in super right, good yeah. shape, but that, that's about it. You know, there's a lot of uh, clicking going on. So. Um, when I kind of transferred to to Apple, and of course it's not Apple's fault that you know I got a little bit overweight, but uh, um, I just kind of dove into that world as my metabolism was changing, and you know in uh, my adolescence and, be, and becoming an adult, that um, uh, I started putting on some weight, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then my back uh, really kind of started to started to hurt me, and uh, when my back started to hurt me, I thought maybe that it was my my bed. I blamed it on my bed, you know, <laughs> that my roommate had sold. Me, sold me a you know piece of garbage or something, but uh, it's actually the most comfortable get bed uh, now that mm -hmm. I've you know returned to a, a respectable figure. But I think that um, what happened for me when I went to the doctor and just said that my back was hurting and you know should it was there anything wrong with my spine or whatever, um, he quite frankly looked at me and said, "You put on 60 pounds in in two years. Your oh, body is your body is." The frame's not used to it. You know, you're carrying a lot more weight. And I think that that was a, a huge wake-up call for me. Um, so I started running. Um, 
uh, I got uh, I was inspired um, because my sister, uh, after having uh, her uh, third child, um, lost a ton of weight and just started running in marathons and and everything. Her oh. name's Brenda, oh, so uh, of course, Walmart. right? The <laughs> right the, the the woman we never let play the games, right? She. Uh, uh, um, she started running and, and lost weight and just looks absolutely fantastic and it, it encouraged me to uh, you know if she can do it I can do it too and uh, you know it was also a time in my life where I needed to take some time to, to think things are very crazy in my life and so mm -hmm. I very much enjoy my silence and a chance to kind of uh, organize my thoughts from the as, day. as you're running as I'm running right and so uh, uh, that kind of became uh, this new thing for me that I needed, that I was kind of, I became addicted to it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I, I'm lucky enough to live uh, down the street from McCarran Park. Um, so there's a track there. Um, and uh, I've been fighting for the mayorship of it on Foursquare for forever. So whoever you are out there that's the mayor of uh, uh, McCarran Track, I'm coming after you. Is that in Brooklyn, but, um, by the way? Yeah, it's, okay. in, uh, it's in Brooklyn and, and Williamsburg. Okay. And, um, I run about six miles when I run, nothing, you know, super crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I run about three miles. I do a little workout on like an outdoor, you know, pull-up bar gym uh, thing that's there, and then I run another three miles. And then I promise myself that I'll uh, that I that I walk home from it, right? Um, to you know, because I could run home, but I want I always want to walk home after a run, you know, to kind of you want to recover. Yes, that's right. a smart thinking. Exactly. So you're being self-taught, but you know, eventually you want to read more about it because that's sure. a very smart instinct yeah. to walk after because you want to cool down, mm -hmm. and that's an excellent way of doing it. Right. It's excellent. about half a mile to the track from my house, so I walk to the track and then I feel you know I stretch when I get to the track I run the three miles do the workout run another three miles and then after that I walk home so that I have kind of a cool down your, your instincts are, are are good because you want to stretch after you warm up a little bit cool. you don't want to do it cold yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. now before we cut for music or musical uh, from you has has the running helped it in your music and have you seen any differences yeah the um, I think you know one of the one of the things that and it, and it it makes complete sense. I don't know why I didn't, you know, draw a correlation between the two before, but um, uh, you know, I, I quit quit smoking, which is uh, of my youth was kind of the uh, uh, um, the smoke monster of lost, if you will, that would kind of follow me around, and, <laughs> you know, um, because I would live with people that would be smoking, and then you know, there it would be back, and I and I did it. But uh, I finally got to a place where I had to cut out all the smoking. I did cut out the smoking. Um, and also started the running, and you know my lung capacity has uh, increased. And so, as far as you know, my comfortability with and, and confidence in holding a note, um, or uh, or delivering a powerful note, or something like that, I just feel a lot more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And I think confidence has so much to do with uh, with singing. And so. Um, uh, I come off better to my audience just because uh, I have a better lung capacity. Okay, um, well, let's, so. uh, let's test that. Let's take a break. <laughs> All right. And then we'll come back and uh, we'll have Patrick, uh, we'll hear Patrick perform a couple of songs. So stay tuned. And this is a song that I wrote called uh, Sad Song on Ukulele. When I picked up the instrument, I realized that every single song that I wrote on it no matter how dark or dreary the lyrics were, they just sounded happy because it's a happy instrument. So I took it upon myself to uh, try to write a sad song on ukulele, and this is what came out. Um, and it's called Sad Song on Ukulele. This is my challenge To write a sad song on ukulele This is my challenge To tug the heartstrings on the baby, baby guitar Never make another noise to love you 
This next song is a song um, um, that I've been covering uh, originally by uh, a gentleman named uh, Martin Sexton, who is a um, an inspiration to me not only um, uh, as a singer but also um, as a self promotionist and a businessman behind the scenes. Um, he releases his records currently on Kitchen Table Records, which quite re- literally means uh, that he sells his records off of his kitchen table um, all by himself and. Uh, uh, I'm pretty passionate about that type of stuff too. So, um, retaining the rights to, um, what you want as an artist, um, and doing it your way. Um, internet makes that possible. I like that. This is a song called, um, I Can't Stop Thinking About You. And, um, it's a song that I was having a lot of trouble singing prior to getting in shape and, um, um, and strengthening, um, my, my, my voice with uh, just being in better shape. Here it goes. Keeping my eyes on the road this time around keeping my hands pressed to the wheel something so strange as a wolf has got me down Don't want to be your damn fool again Driving tonight just to ease my mind And a man in this mood is the most dangerous kind There was a time when my head went blind, I couldn't see the sign of the time. Years would go by before I wondered who, or where, or what, or why. Loving you is like loving a house on fire. Burning and learning, baby, after the damage was done. And scared and wide open and almost, almost had it all. Oh, I'm sick and tired of hoping maybe a cure will be found, but I just can't stop. Face to face with what I've been running from all of these years Hangs a dark cloud over my moon I 
I pull over to this roadside dive and maybe taste my sobriety. Bowed on a tall, cold ginger ale. Thinking about those days when I was loving you with like loving a fifth of the finest bourbon. Was it your quality? Thank you for tuning in. My name is Patrick Larney. That's P-A-T-R-Y-K-L-A-R-N-E-Y. And I want to thank Will for having me on the program. So thanks for tuning in, and I got to run. Peace. Peace.